de Bert Dumars, quien es vicepresidente y analista de la empresa Forrester, que es una empresa aliada de Canietti con la que hemos tenido, eh, hemos laborado en los últimos años y que nos ha ayudado mucho. Y sin más, pues, quisiera dejar eh, en el micrófono para arrancar con la comida, con, con la, arrancar con la ponencia a uh, Bert Dumars. Bert, thank you very much. started. Can, you all can hear me? Sure. So uh, my job today is to wake you up after lunch <laughs> and get you going and get you excited. Um, we will go to the, there's the first slide. So this is me and you can see at the bottom there for any of you who tweet or on Twitter, BW Dumars, feel free to tweet, Twitter, do any social networking you wish, LinkedIn, Facebook, any social networks that are local to talk about this presentation or anything else that's going on during the day. Um, that's what I usually do. I've been doing social networking for many years and um, have been with Forrester for a little over 10 months. And previous to being at Forrester, as you can probably see in my bio, I was the vice president of digital marketing and e-commerce at Newell Rubbermaid, which is a multi-brand company in, um, in the US. But I'm here today to talk to you about digital disruption. And this is something that's really near and dear to my heart and near and dear to what's going on at Forrester and what we're seeing both you know, around the world and even in small places. And um, I think this is gonna be a really interesting discussion and I hope at the end you have some questions because I have some questions for you at the end and things to think about. So, there we go. So I wanna open with a little story. And this is a story about a book. Has anyone, and I found one person so far, has anyone heard of the book Wool? You may not have. No hands, okay. Wool is a little book. It was written, the first three chapters were written two years ago. Wool is an ebook. It is sold on Amazon. And um, the author was living in a little town called Boone, North Carolina. He was working in a bookstore. He had written two previous books to this one. They had, told a sol they had sold a total of 1,000 copies for 99 cents a piece. He was not rich. His wife was working at the college, and they were making ends meet in a little two-bedroom two apartment. He wrote the first three chapters of this book, and he said, I'm going to do this a different way. He tried to go to publishers. He went to 100 publishers, and they all turned him down. They said, we've seen your work before. There's nothing here. So he took the first three chapters, and he found influencers on a site called Goodreads. Goodreads is a social networking site for people who review books, read books, and talk about the books they've read. He found 30 science fiction. This is a science fiction book. Um, have any of you heard of The Hunger Games? Okay. This is just like The Hunger Games, but a different world and a different space. And he got 30 of these science fiction reviewers to read the chapters. They loved the book, and they started writing about it. They started writing reviews. Sales started picking up. He put it for sale on Amazon for 99 cents. Then he wrote the next section of the book, 99 cents. Then he wrote the next section. 99 cents, and the sales kept going. Then he put it all together into one book for $5.99, and the next thing he knew, he was selling 50,000 copies a month. 50,000 ebooks a month. This book is the most reviewed book in the history of Amazon.com. This book has thousands of reviews. Not only did he um, sell lots of books and make lots of money, one day Amazon said, let's just try this. Let's sell this $5.99 book for 99 cents and see what happens. In one day it sold 20,000 copies, a single day. So the next thing that happens is all those publishers that had turned him down, wouldn't talk to him, had said go away, all of a sudden were knocking on his door saying we want the rights to this book. And he said, no, you can have the hard copy rights, but the digital rights are mine forever. I will never ever give up the digital rights. They all walked away but one, and one bought the hard copy rights for $2 million, just the hard copy rights. The next call he got was from Hollywood. He sold the movie rights, too, for another couple million dollars. So you'll be seeing this, just like The Hunger Games, will be, there'll be a movie made about this book, and there's two books after it, probably in about two or three years. And what he did by himself, using free social networks, his own PR, which was him, and 
free platforms that were available to him like Amazon.com, Facebook, Goodreads, Twitter, was he created a mammoth seller of a book. And he did this all by himself. Was, was spending little to no money at all. So now he's a multimillionaire. He's been highlighted in the Wall Street Journal. He um, has written, he's written his three books. If you actually go to Amazon.com and you look at the top selling books in science fiction, one of his three books is always in the top 10. And he goes back and forth with The Hunger Games and some of the other, other books that have already been made into movies. This is an example of what digital disruption has enabled. Someone by themselves can take on the publishing industry and turn it on its head. And I love this story, and I've read all these books too. By the way, the stories are great. It's a great story. So with that, let's talk about what else is going on in this industry. Um, oh, there we go. So one thing at Forrester that, we, that, that he did and he thought about was, who are the customers, who are the readers of his book, and what's their experience going to be like reading his book? And it's hard to see this, but have any of you heard of like Porter's Five Forces? The, the strategy five forces model, yeah, I see a few hands. So in today's world, the Porter's five, five forces model are really turned on their ears because potential entrants into your market can easily enter because there is, there is little, there's little to stop them from entering. It's easy to enter, there's, the platforms are free and easy. Buyers, customers have a lot of power now. They can look at reviews of your products and services. They can look at reviews of restaurants, of books, of movies, of services from your businesses. And they can see what other people have said. And all this information is available publicly. Threats of substitutes. Substitutes are easy to create now. You can outsource them. You can outsource them. You, some US companies outsource them here. Some of your companies can outsource them to China. You can outsource to get things built and created fairly easily today. And then there's the power of suppliers. Suppliers from around the world now have power, don't have as much power as they used to have, but they have the ability to create. And then industry competitors can do all the industry analysis on your company. It's all public. Google search yourself. Google search your company. There's lots there to learn about and lots there to learn about each other. So in the age that we live in today, we live in this world of digital disruption that's enabled by all of these services and all of this technology. And this age of the customer has been evolving over time. From the 1900s, the age of the manufacturing, to the age of distribution, to the age of information, to now the age of the customer. What these companies think about, and companies that you probably know, they think about first, what's the customer experience? That's the most important thing. How do I think about the customer experience first, and then back in all the services and products and technology I need to make that successful? So I'm going to show you some examples of that of companies that are doing that and companies that you wouldn't even imagine are even thinking about that right now. But some we have listed here are Macy's, Salesforce.com, Amazon, USAA as examples. Do you guys know USAA? Have you heard of them? They're you know, a big insurance company. Um, they focus mostly on um, veterans, US veterans, military veterans, but they do incredible customer service wrapped around their insurance. And that's how they, they make people feel happy. And what was really interesting, I was in Minneapolis um, about a week and a half ago and I was running an, a marketing innovation workshop. And I had a couple banks and a couple healthcare companies and 3M, 3M, the big innovation, product innovation company. And I said, who, you know, when you think about the world you're living in today, do you see digital disruptors entering your markets? And they all kind of nodded. And the bank said, yeah, we see Ally, who's a digital, a pure digital bank that's entered our space. And I didn't think the healthcare person would say something, but she was nodding and she goes, yes. We just had a new company enter our space that we'd never seen before. They're backed by private equity, and their whole business model is to be like Zappos. Have you heard of Zappos, the company in the US? The shoe company. That whole company's model is all around customer service. And they said, this new little insurance company is grabbing customers left, right, all over the place, purely by offering the best customer service out there. So that's what, that's what we mean by thinking about the customer and the customer service aspect of digital disruption. So customer obsession, building value around the customer, not the channel or product. Think of the customer first, think of what the customer needs and what products and services you can wrap around them and then think about, okay, what kind of products could I create? What do I have? What expertise do I have in my company that I can leverage and use and take advantage of what those customers need? So let's meet the digital consumer that we're all facing today. And by the way, I have a 13-year-old and a 9-year-old at home, and I just watch them in awe. 
My nine-year-old can move from device to device, from iPad to iPod, from iPhone to DVD player, to tel do big screen TV, to DVR recorder, and she can avoid commercials like No Tomorrow. So how do we market to this little girl when she turns 16 and has learned for her whole life that she can avoid any commercial she wants, doesn't have to worry about it? And my son's even worse. So 13-year-old boys, what do they do? They play games. How do you get to them? There is actually, um, in the US, there is a site, it's on YouTube, it's called Machinima. And Machinima, what boys do, boys between the ages of, I think roughly eight and 30, <laughs> it's a wide range of boys, they record the games they play and then they load them up to YouTube. And they have competitions and they have tournaments and they actually record the people playing the games, not just the games themselves. And you think, well, that just doesn't sound like much fun. I mean, wouldn't you just want to play the game? No, they had millions. They had more views during the month of December last year than any other television show in the United States, than any other network in the United States. And it was the only place that you could guarantee that you could find males between the ages of 8 and 30, that you could reach them. Now think about that from a media company. That's where they were. That's what they were playing. So this is our new digital consumer. And so when consumers adopt technology, they do old things in new ways. But when people internalize technology, they find new things to do. So adopt and internalize. So think about it. Watch your kids, watch people on the street with smartphones. Look at how they internalize the use. You know that um, what's, what, will someone t what will someone call about faster there? Losing their smartphone or losing their credit card? It's the smartphone. Typically, they'll call about their smart, they will contact someone to get their smartphone back within an hour. The credit card, maybe a week. That, that's, a, that's a true statement. So this is, this is our new digital person, Mark Zuckerberg. And he's a digital disruptor, just like many others out there. So when companies adopt technology, they do old things in new ways and when companies internalize technology, they find new things to do. So they find new business models, they find new opportunities, they don't stop just where they started. So Google started as a search company. What are they today? They build self-driving cars. They are using, they're actually invested in energy development. They're doing all kinds of different things. Facebook is turning from a social network into an advertising platform into a mobile platform, into an operating system over time. So they look at new things. So digital disruption, does anyone remember the $6 million man? Some of us do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, so is better, faster, and stronger? I don't think $6 million was enough. I think they meant $6 billion, but <laughs> when they th were thinking of him. But digital disruption is better, str uh, stronger, and faster than anything else that we've ever seen in, in our history. And to satisfy digital consumers in the, f in, in the future, you must be and enable um, digital disruptors. So you've got to become one, and you've got to enable them. You've got to be thinking about them. Not only are there digital disruptors out there, we also call, there's other groups called perpetually connected. Those are the ones that are always on mobile. These people are all over the place, and they're growing faster and faster as, a as segments. So knowing this is in place, you've got to think about how are you going to approach these markets? How are you going to think about the world that we are now living in that's advancing faster and faster and faster. So let's talk. So we're going to talk about digital disruption, how it's different from other forms of disruption. We're going to talk about the three steps to becoming a digital disruptor. And I'm also going to give you some ideas that I've come across thinking in terms of what should you be doing? What, what types of things, what new things are happening in the United States and what types of things are happening here in Mexico? And I have a slide on that that really should change the way we all think about digital disruption, how we approach markets, and how we approach our customers. And then, are you and your organization ready? So, so the first thing is, we can't just build a better mousetrap. That's been the old model for most companies for a long, long time. Building a better mousetrap, building a better product. Incremental innovation is nice, but if you think about it, there's been case study after case study of incremental innovation, you keep getting better and better, then all of a sudden someone comes underneath you. 
And they don't offer the same thing you offer. They offer it for a lot less money. It's not as feature rich or as functional as what you offer. And the next thing you know, they have 5% of your market and then 10 and 20. Dell did that in the 90s to HP, IBM, and Compaq. Other companies are doing it today. Apple's doing it. And they've grown and gotten much faster. So when you think about this digital disruption, you've got to think about how do I get out of my convention, a widely accepted belief, and think about disruption. So this is a radical new idea to help reach the vision faster. So what's disrupting? And then think about vision. What's going to be your vision? A projection of the company in the future. So what's the company going to look like five years from now, ten years from now? Thinking about the market, the company, the world you're going to actually live in and work in. And digital disruption really comes, kind of comes down and looks like this. So in the old days, <coughs> when you wanted to do innovation, the talent was concentrated in very large organizations. It cost a lot of money to innovate. And you came out with a few innovations that would change the world. Not, not a lot, but a few. In the digital disrupted world, there are lots of people disrupting. Tons. Like Hugh Howey, who wrote Wool. Like, other, like kids who are writing games and, and making enough money with their first game to pay for their entire college education. And they do it at one-tenth or one-one-hundredth or one one thousandth the cost. It doesn't cost as much. And they develop 100 times the number of innovations. Not all innovations succeed, but they're developing them faster and more often. And it doesn't take a lot of money to do it. So these guys are utilizing a lot of free platforms and free technologies. These are the platforms that they're utilizing. Facebook, Google, Apple, the iTunes Store, Salesforce, Amazon Web Services, and there are many others out there that they're taking advantage of. They're building whole businesses on top of, and they aren't hiring lots of employees. They're very small. They're very nimble. They might be individuals. Do you remember when Yahoo bought that little company in London just about a year ago? Did you, did you hear about that? Some of you might have. So they bought this little company in London. What this kid had built, and it was a kid, he built a new reader. So Google had turned off Google Reader where they were going to shut it down. And this kid really liked the Google Reader, so he developed his own. And he did it with a couple friends. And Yahoo came a call and said, we really like what you did. We'd like to acquire your company. And they were offering him roughly $25 million. And his biggest concern was, well, is it OK if I graduate high school first? <laughs> he was 15 years old. And he developed a company that was worth $25 million. And he'd done it just using free services. And he built it. So this is something that's happening more and more out there. And companies like these are popping up. And these are companies you want to look at to say, more from a business model perspective, how are they doing it and why are they doing it? So you have Netflix, Mint, you have a financial services. This one over here on the left, the little scale, it's a little company called Lose It. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Then there's Square and there's Flipboard and Evernote. Evernote's really interesting. Evernote's a place where you can take notes, for any of you who have used it. Um, it's free to use, but they do have a premium service that they estimate somewhere between 5 and 10% of their customers will take advantage of. That 5 and 10% pays for everything. It's enough money that it pays for the entire business model. And so Evernote is used by millions of people, and they have a nice little business model, and they make a ton of money off the 5 to 10% of their customers who actually pay. So how do you compete against someone like that who's willing to compete at that level? And the other thing that we're facing now is the adoption of mobile. So for those of you who remember the iPod, when the iPod first came out, it took two years for the iPod to sell a million uni units. So the iPhone 5C and 5S, which just launched a few weeks ago, they sold 9 million units in two days. The iPad that's going to launch yesterday, and we'll talk about that, that's going to launch here on November 1st, will probably sell 9 or 10 million in two days. So think about the adoption rates. And these aren't just US purchases. These are global purchases, because they're, low, they're launching those global. Consumers have decided that this is the path they're going on. It is estimated there's going to be you know, well over was it, 900 million tablets out there in the market by 2017. It's a whole new model. It's a whole new way of actually consuming and engaging. Customer behavior is changing rapidly. We as businesses have to figure out how we're going to adapt and adopt to, this new to these new customer behaviors. Otherwise, other companies will. So the adoption of this technology by customers has changed everything. You know, think about the old days 
And I was in IT for many years, and we used to say, okay, we're going to buy 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 PCs for our, our employees, and we're going to put everyone on the same model. This doesn't happen as much anymore. Today, CIOs have to deal with the fact that, that, that employees are bringing in their own devices. They're becoming much more efficient and effective using tablet computers or lightweight notebooks or smartphones that they've brought in that they can do more things with. So this world is not only changing consumers, it's also changing the way people work. And one, when, when you think about digital disruption, one of the key tenets is looking for the adjacent possible. And if you've probably heard of the Nest, or the, some of you have heard of it, it's the, um, so this is, this is a thermostat in the United States. So has anyone heard of the Nest? No, no hands, okay. Uh, maybe a couple in the back. So Nest is a thermostat. So think about it, a thermostat, just like you would have at your home for your air conditioning and your heating. Typical thermostat. That thermostat costs $249. And they've sold hundreds of thousands of this thermostat. But what this thermostat does is it does something different from every other thermostat. It figures out when you're in, the, when you're in your home, how you're using energy, and what's going on in your house. And so it adjusts. They have figured out that <coughs> The several hundred thousand that have been deployed have saved over a billion kilowatts of energy in the United States so far. So what's the adjacent possible? So where would Nest go? And Nest are a bunch of ex-Apple guys. And it's not a big company. So where would they go from there? They said, hmm, you know what else could be really important in a house? A smoke detector. So that's Protect on the right. That's their next product that's coming out. It's a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide detector. And you're saying, why would you go into a market where the average cost for a smoke detector is somewhere between $20 and $50, and they're charging $150 for that? Well, all these devices are connected by Wi-Fi. This smoke detector has been built thinking purely of the customer. So the one thing they did when they tested smoke detectors was they tested them with children. Children do not hear the buzzing of smoke detectors when they're in deep sleep. It doesn't wake them up. But if you put a female voice that says, wake up, there's a fire, get out of the house. That's what Protect does. So when you have that in your children's room, it wakes up the child. They've tested this over and over again. They actually went through thousands of women's voices, determining which was going to be their voice actor for that, and determining which voice would actually wake up children. So this device, they tested it over and over again, is going to go on sale for $149. So it's going to be more than double the highest costing smoke detector out there on the market. And it's going to connect into with the Nest, and it's going to make you have a smart, phone, a smart home. This is the adjacent possible. These are guys who used to build iPhones and iPads, and they decided to build thermostats and smoke detectors. Talk about a market that's kind of boring, kind of dull, but they're actually blowing the doors off on it. So think about where you could go from where you are today. So think about what is the next thing people need. So this is that one I was going to tell you about. It's called Lose It. So Lose It is um, developed by, it's a little company, and it's all about weight loss. And they've developed an app, and so you can keep track of the calories you eat, and um, they have, you know, you, 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 it tracks it, gives you like nice, nice little gauges. But then you can actually connect with other people who are trying to lose weight as well. And what they found is that connecting with people you know will not cause you to lose weight, but connecting with people you don't know who have the same goals as you and you're going down a similar path will. So they've done all this studying. So they're gathering all this data on this app. This company is an eight-person company. They have millions of customers. They are killing Weight Watchers and Nutrisystem in the United States who have had those business models for years. And the, um, this is the, uh, the CEO. So let's not pretend that we know the end game here. Let's do the least amount of features to know if it will work, then improve it for the people to use it. So every time he thinks about changing that app, he thinks about how can I make it simpler and easier? The guys at Nest, the guys who did the Nest and the Protect did the same thing. How can we make it simpler and easier? How can we do it with less features? How can we give the best customer experience possible? And his thing here is, his other theory about his company is, he has eight employees and he says that's enough. That's all we need. How can we keep this business going with eight employees? We can hire contractors, we can outsource other people, but we're gonna keep our company eight employees and grow this business. So that's another model that he's thinking about. He's a digital disruptor. 
So when you think about the iPad and Apple, think about the iPad mini. So that was the adjacent possible for them. And think about the ecosystem that they've built around it. It's the customer experience. The one thing that is noted about the iPad is that they've wrapped this whole customer experience around it. And if you look at the new one that just launched yesterday, the iPad Air, it's better, faster, thinner, and lighter with a powerful customer, customer experience ecosystem. What's the one thing they touted over and over again during that announcement? The one thing they said was, okay, we might be losing market share, but we still own all the tablet internet access. The next closest competitor has only 5.7% of the tablet internet access. They have 80. And yet they're, they're sitting around 50% of the market. So they've created the customer experience that drives more usage and more loyalty. And when actually when consumers get asked the question, even if you have an Android phone, what's your preference? If you had your next opportunity, no matter, you know, if you had the money, which would you buy? And they typically say they'll buy an iPhone because they want that customer experience. It's really interesting. So I'm going to talk to you about some companies that you wouldn't think in the digital disruption space. Have any of you been to the United States and been to a Chick-fil-A? They are, a, a, some of you, yes. <laughs> it's a great chicken sandwich, so just so you know. They're based in Atlanta. They are, um, they're a quick serve restaurant. They're, they compete with McDonald's. They compete with uh, Burger, Wendy's, uh, Burger King, Wendy's, and so on. Um, they found that they had become very risk averse as a company. Um, they had, they're very successful. They're $4.6 billion in revenue. They have almost 2,000 stores and they're growing about 80 stores a year. Very successful, very profitable. But they had grown this model of everything had to be perfect or it didn't launch. So for them to do any new marketing program was taking two to three years to do it. For them to launch a new food menu item was taking two to three years because if it wasn't perfect, they weren't gonna launch it. So they would have a meeting and say, is it perfect? Nope, let's go back and we'll keep trying. And they'd try over and over again, very risk averse. And what they decided to do was start trying some things. And one of the things that they came up with was, it's all around customer experience. How can we make multi-generations love our brand? And they came up with this program called the Daddy-Daughter Date Night Program. And it was, it was actually in Kansas. And they had the father, the, um, the owner, because the, it's a franchise business, the owner of that particular store said, I see dads and daughters come to my store all the time and they don't talk to each other. And these are girls between ages of four and eight and, and young fathers. He said, what if we had a special night at a fast food restaurant and we put out white tablecloths and we made it just for them and had special seating and had, and we had uh, talking starters. So he created this program. He sold it out, had four seatings, carved off a part of the restaurant, put out white tablecloths, brought that idea to the CEO of Chick-fil-A, and they started launching it around their different markets. They sell out every one of these events. They now pick up families in limousines and horse carriages to bring them to a fast food restaurant. These are not, <laughs> these are $5 sandwiches. This is not five-star restaurant, but they make it a five-star experience. And so what has ended up happening, they've done surveys, and then, they, then what ends up going around is social networking. It's all hyper-local around the store. And then people just, they, they fall in love with the whole concept and the brand. So what they, then they launched from there and then they had, they both had the, uh, then they have this daughter-son date night. Then they have, the, then they have a daughter-son, sorry, mom-son date night. Then they, then they did the family date night. All of a sudden they started seeing multiple generations. They had the kids, they had the parents, and then they had the grandparents. So what does that do for your brand? You've locked in the current buyers, you've locked in the future. So they now have the future, are always going to think of Chick-fil-A as the special place for them to go, even though it's a fast food restaurant. It's a very different model for thinking. One other thing that they did, and this is one thing I'm going to talk about in a little bit, is they have developed an innovation lab. So this is a fast food restaurant. They developed an innovation lab called The Hatch. It sits right across the street from their headquarters. Because they saw that their middle management had all become so perfection striving and so risk averse, they couldn't get them to try anything new. So they created a space where they could try new things. They put in a couple of restaurants in there. They've actually run marketing hackathons and they've run IT hackathons in the space. So they get their employees in there to try working together and try new things. And they, put, they give them problems to solve. And so that's one of the things. So this is a fast food restaurant 
who's focusing in on digital. And actually, if you went to a Chick-fil-A, you would see they now have iPads, that they have people going out. And so when you go through the drive-thru, you actually get, you, put, you give your order to a person who inputs it into an iPad because they found they give you a better customer experience. It also delivered the food faster and the customers were much, much happier. So they're integrating digital and technology into a fast food restaurant. The next one I want to talk about, so you have 7-Elevens, correct? 7-Elevens, some? A place, a place you all go hang out, right? It's a place you would love to think of, the convenience store. Okay. <laughs> so 7-Elevens. So no one thinks of them as, a, as an innovator. They're a convenience store. Why would you think about them in digital, right? So they, um, and they weren't. They were very transaction focused. Um, but they were an innovator in 1962 when they were the first store in the United States to go 7 by 24 by 365. They did it in Las Vegas. So they opened that. So that changed the whole market in retail. But beyond that then was all transaction focused. Their first, first program was a Slurpee Nation program. Has anyone ever had a Slurpee? Some people? Anyway. A Slurpee. <laughs> so it's a Slurpee. It's a drink. So they did a program around it. And it was like, have any of you done Coke Rewards? My Coke Rewards? Or heard of that program? So it's a program where you actually keep track of what Slurpees. So they found out what Slurpee flavors they liked, what time of day they were drinking Slurpees. So they found all this information about one SKU, and they thought, wow, that's really impressive. What can we do with that data? The next thing they ran was called Seven Election. They ran this during the Obama and Romney presidential campaign. And so they had, they put little, a blue coffee cup and a red coffee cup in the stores. And if you were going to vote for Romney, you would pick the red cup. And if you were going to vote for Obama, you'd pick the blue cup. What ended up happening was, is um, government pollsters, po political pollsters started looking at their data because they had more accurate data than any of the political po pollsters had. They, by county in the United States, got everyone right. They didn't get the exact percentage, but they got who won that county correct based on coffee cups. That's powerful data. They looked at that and they said, with that data, what could we do? And they said, we could develop an API strategy. They have over 8,000 stores in the United States, 9.5 million transactions a day. That's a lot of data. What could we do with that data? We could take that data and we could develop APIs. And once they developed the APIs, they said, let's do a hackathon at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. So they ran a hackathon with uh, developers. And the developers, the developer guy who, the, the developer who won, developed an SMS text app for a feature phone, not for a smartphone because he looked at the demographics of their market, which was middle income down to low income, and he realized that market, those people had feature phones, not smartphones. And by having feature phones, he could create something. Also, 7-Eleven is in a lot of markets around the world where feature phones are still prevalent. So he won the hackathon competition because he was able to deliver coupons and other promotions through a feature phone very simply and easily based on the APIs that they developed. The next thing they did was they developed a smartphone app. You're thinking, okay, now they're, they're getting into smartphone apps. This is a cool smartphone app. It is content in context. So based on the time of day, based on the location where you are, it changes the content in the app. So if it's in the morning, it gives you breakfast items. If it's in the afternoon, it's lunch, snack, dinner. And what they see the world is, they, they think of the world as, and this is where they set their big audacious goal, and thinking in terms of what is our company going to be like eight years from now or ten years from now, they said, by 2020, we expect that 50% of all of our revenue is going to come through digital. And that's not e-commerce. And that's not disintermediating the stores. That means they're going to turn those physical stores into digital hubs. And their mobile experiences are going to drive customers in there. And they're going to, they're, they're, they're going to sell new services and new products and really change the way that they do business in the future. Because they see their customers changing every day. So they put in a whole new CRM systems in those stores, and they're going to collect data and find out what their customers want and need. So that's really thinking, that's really turning on its head and thinking about what's the customer need and what's the experience we want to deliver. And this is a convenience store. This isn't someone you would think of as a digital disruptor. And they developed a whole innovation team, and the innovation team focuses on partnerships and the API strategy and how do we leverage the partnerships, whether it's with, with an agency partner or a technology partner. Okay. And you can see it in the numbers. For companies in the US who focus on customer experience, customer experience leaders, they are growing faster, their stock price is their value. For companies who are customer experience laggards, they are not. 
So if you focus on customer experience and you think of the customer first, you're likely you're going to grow your stock much faster. So that was one thing that we did to validate that this data actually was real. So when you think about digital disruption, there are three things that you have to think about when you think about yourself and how you're going to change your organization. One is energy. Are you going to put the energy into actually creating new digital, digital capabilities, new digital, using new digital platforms, and actually drive these projects forward? Are you going to hire the skills or develop the skills in your company to actually do that? And then what policies are you going to change to unleash your employees, to make them more powerful, to make them more productive, and to really drive digital disruption in your organization? And the reason we say that is because we've done studies, and everyone sees it coming. People say, 89% of the people we've researched have said, we see digital is coming. Customer behavior is changing. The way they interact with our business is different than it was two years ago or three years ago. What they expect of it from us is different. But we kind of, we have the energy around it. We know we want to do this. We don't have all the skills we need. And we don't have the policies in place. This is the opportunity. And digital disruptors know that they've got to get this, this part going that the policy has to change. You have to think about that from a policy perspective. Now, I'm going to bring this back to you. So you've seen her, I think. This is the cover of Wired magazine. It just came out in the United States. That's being seen by all the US. So this is your future, but this is our future. When we think about where is digital disruption going to come from, look at the title of that, the next Steve Jobs. That's the way they looked at her, but not her just by herself her as a group of people, of students, a group of Mexican kids, a group of American kids, Canadian kids. How do we get those kids to be the next digital disruptors? How do we get them to leverage our, our, you know, our space, our world, and become successful? And I thought a lot of this article is focused on the teaching methodologies, but it's also focused on the technology that these kids need to be successful and to explore. And if you think about it, we're all kind of suffering from this. The United States suffers from this as well. Not every child has access to the internet like they should, and not every child has access to technology. A country that's really done a remarkable job in this space is South Korea. South Korea made it a government policy that they were going to fiber optic wire to everyone's home, right? What happens when you give that much bandwidth to every person in your country? It changes the way they interact. It changes the way they do games. It changes the way they build technology. And you can see it actually with the way that they're actually creating new technologies and services out of South Korea. But I brought this up to you because I think this is really important to think about. How do we make this person successful? And how do we make this person the employee that you want to have in your company and all the different skills and capabilities that she'll have? And her classmates as well. Because I think that's really powerful. So I, I actually went off and I did some research. And I've been doing some research in the United States as well of how to actually become a digital disruptor and how to really change your company and what companies are doing. So you really have to unshackle yourself from the industrial age mindset. You've got to think in terms of flexibility of how employees are actually going to work today. And innovation is not just incremental. It's, it must be your focus and it must be thinking in terms of big leaps, big problems to solve and big opportunities to pursue. I've talked to several, many innovation leaders over innovation labs and the one thing they all said is, we don't do incremental innovation. That's for the operations teams to focus on. We go after the big problems and the big opportunities. We look at how can we leverage mobile? How can we leverage big data? And how can we actually change the way our businesses work? So that's the one thing that they always look at. Another thing that's going on in the United States, and one thing I would recommend that you do is because you have them here too, are get involved with these startup accelerators. So you have several in here in Mexico City, 500 Mexico City, the Wire in Mexico, out, out Alta Ventures, the Founder Institute of Mexico City. If you have not visited one of these startup accelerators, go spend some time there. In the US, we have them in, ma in many major cities. I went to one called the Atlanta Tech Village, and they have 100 startups sitting in one building. And they said the most amazing thing about it was is that if a startup fails, the talent is recycled to other startups because they're immediately recruited by the other companies that are sitting in there. And every Friday, they do startup um, showcases where investors and big brands come in and pay attention and listen. And one company, PepsiCo, in New York, actually put employees in a startup accelerator full time. That is where their digital innovation lab is. 
It's not a separate building, it's not a headquarters, it's actually in the Startup Accelerator. So this is a huge opportunity and a way to think about how do you engage with startups and digital disruptors and how do you get them to help you solve big problems in your companies? Because these guys are focusing on big problems. They all want to be successful, they want to they make a lot of money, typically, and if there's a problem to solve, they're pretty smart and, they, and they're focused and they want to do it. Also, Coca-Cola has the Coca-Cola Accelerator in Mexico City. They don't have one of, they, they actually use other accelerators in the United States, but they're developing their own here, which is all around technology. So this is a beverage company focusing on technology and technology startups. That's a way to think about where are the opportunities for you. And the other thing is, visit an innovation lab. If you don't have one yourself, visit an innovation lab in the United States, or as Mondelez, which, is a, which was the craft spinoff, put theirs in Buenos Aires, Argentina. They put their innovation lab in Buenos Aires, Argentina because they did not want it to have a US mindset. They wanted to have a global mindset. They knew that for their company, the US market was gonna grow two to 3% a year, but outside the US, they could grow 10, 15, 20% depending on the market. So they put their lab in Buenos Aires instead of in Chicago or Dallas, which they were thinking of. But also think about an innovation team or lab in your space. Lots of companies are doing this now. They're putting them in places like Silicon Valley, but for you, it might be better to have it inside your corporate because a lot of people are doing that as well, like a Chick-fil-A. So in summary, digital disruption is coming to an industry near you. And if you don't do something about it, <laughs> it's coming. It's coming whether, you're, whether you want to take it on or not. So you've got to be there. And the $6 million man, it will be better, stronger, and faster. This is not slowing down. This is speeding up. The adoption of technology by your customers is happening faster and faster. And the, the smart competitors are going to be adopting it as well and figuring out how they can leverage it and how they can grow fast. And most companies see it coming, but fewer are prepared. This is everywhere. This is not just here. This is in the United States. This is in Europe. There are lots of companies who are content. They're making money. They're fairly risk averse. And they're not moving as quickly as, their as this opportunity is facing them. And there are several that are, though. So you have to be, you have to be jumping and getting on this bandwagon as fast as you can. So with that, I open it to questions. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, there's one over here. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for all your comments. They were very enlightening. Uh, Melissa Munoz from Tentlix, and I want to know uh, how do you um, envision putting together a strategy when so many people said that uh, visitors or users in your Facebook page equals revenue? Oh. As so many times we have heard and seen companies invest so hard in Facebook for example, and then turn nothing in terms of customers. Right, so, so when you think about Facebook, what you have to think about Facebook, Facebook is a place where people are gonna like you who already know you. Facebook is not a place typically where they're going to find you or discover you. A better place for discovering you is on Google, as an example. So I know a lot of people put a lot of effort into Facebook and they still continue to put effort into Facebook, but they're also finding that other social networks have a better have a better resonance for their brand. So for some brands, for some consumer brands, and this is like big consumer brands, Facebook is a great place. Movies, new movies that come out, Facebook is a great place to leverage interest and to build it up quickly around a movie. But if you're a B to are you a B2B brand? Do you sell to other businesses? B2B, yes. So when you're selling to other businesses, Facebook is not the best place. A better place to leverage that is LinkedIn, because that's where professionals hang out. So think in terms of, when you, have to, when you think about social networks, you gotta think about where are people hanging out and why are they there? So most people are on Facebook because they wanna be with friends and family, and people maybe they haven't seen for a long time. They're not there to really necessarily hang out with business associates. But if you go on LinkedIn, they're there to hang out with business associates. So there's a space where people aren't talking about what they ate for dinner, they're talking about what business problems they're trying to solve 
or what new innovations they're seeing in the marketplace. On Facebook, they're talking about, well, here's a picture of my kids, here's my dog, here's what I ate for dinner, happy birthday, everyone, here's some games I played. It's a different animal. So you have to think about what the social networks are like and what people who are on there are expecting from those social networks. D does that make sense? Yes, totally. Yeah. Thank you so much. So another great place where businesses are having some success is Twitter. Because Twitter, when you put stuff on Twitter, it's searchable. So think about when you put something out there, content. You want that content to be searchable, especially when you're trying to sell to other businesses. Because you want to put out content and thinking in terms of how am I a thought leader in my, in my space or my industry. So that's why when you look at the social networks, you got to think, where are the places where I could reach my customers, my clients, that would make sense for them and for me and for us to communicate? It could be a blog, might be a better place for you. It could be LinkedIn. It could be just drawing them into your homepage, your, your website. Um, but thinking in terms of those, so there's professional places and there's social places. And social places are really places where if you're in the entertainment industry or if you're a, um, a highly known beverage, you know, some sort of very broadly known brand, it's a great place to, to, to interact. But if you're not, it may not be the best place to interact. Thank you. <laughs> this is uh, so many of my customers in, in terms of IT want to uh, jump to Facebook and every time I say it's not a good idea to have a Facebook strategy if you're in IT and in, in B2B that I wanted to have an expert's point of view. So yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, so, so the one thing to think about, when, especially when you're in a B2B space, you want to think of yourselves as how am I going to become a content leader? I want to create content that shows I'm a leader. I'm a knowledge. I'm knowledgeable as a company. I'm knowledgeable as my employees. I'm showing leadership around some content, some skill set. That's what you want to show when you're in, in, especially in the social networking space. If you're a consumer brand, it's a different story. Consumer brands, it's a lot more engagement. It can be more fun. It can be more interactive in that sense. But B2B brands have to be very careful about how they engage because they can also upset a client. And you have to be just very careful about how you engage on these social networks. I think we have another question over here. Yes, thank yes. you. <laughs> um, what would you recommend to change the mindset of the companies? Okay, so there's a couple things, and I've done these myself. So one is make sure that every executive has an iPad. I'm, I'm not kidding. Every executive in your company should have an iPad, because if they don't, they will not understand what it's like. An iPad, an Android pad, it doesn't matter, a tablet. They've got to have a tablet. They've got to experience that. That will change their mindset. So, for example, um, and I was told this by the, the Comcast people, the CEO of Comcast had not used an iPad, so he couldn't understand why would they want to stream content through an iPad, through a, through a mobile application. Finally, the executive team got him an iPad and they got him to use it. Literally within one week he was saying, why don't we have a mobile app on iPads? Why are we not streaming content through iPads? Why are we not changing our whole business model? That was one week, a CEO had an iPad for one week and changed his whole mindset. So oftentimes, the best way to get them to change their mindset is to actually get them on the technology. Another tactic to use is to assign a mentor to the executives so that the mentor can teach the executives behind closed doors, under NDA, risk of death, we will never say how, the, how advanced the executive was in the technology, and teach them about the technology. Teach them about social networks, about e-commerce, about mobile and mobile apps and the benefits of those, and walk them through that in a private thing, and do it one-on-one. -on -one. And that's another method that has worked very well also. Um, there are others, but those are kind of two of the, the, two of the quick start ones to get it going. And I would say the other thing is, I pointed out some startup accelerators here that are in Mexico City, and if you have a startup accelerator near you, get one or a couple of your executives to go and visit. I guarantee you, they will be excited to have you visit, and you will see things going on, you will see the way they work, you will see the way they interact. It's very different, and it's very enlightening. It really opens your eyes, and it's, and it's exciting, too. There's a, these are exciting, fun, energized places. So I would just suggest any of you or all of you try and spend you know, a day with them. L take, have them take you on tour. Um, I think that's, it's a great way to, to really open, open yourselves up. Thank Other you. questions? Yeah. We got this side of the room. Is anyone this side? <laughs> Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. 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 Thirty percent for me. Go ahead, please. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bud. Thank you.